Richard Skipper celebrates. Every show is a celebration. Each show, Richard delivers the artists you love, showcasing what makes them unique. Never gossipy. The antidote to a sometimes hectic world. Now, here's your host, Richard Skipper. Happy Tuesday, everyone, and welcome to Richard Skipper Celebrates. It's December. Can you believe that we've made it through this amazing year? Ups, downs, and everything in between. I also want to take a moment to mention that it was 264 days ago today that our theaters went dark in New York. So I want to send out a special uh thought and prayer to every single person, uh, and that includes all of us who has been affected uh, by COVID-19. We're going to get through this, and we're going to be back bigger and brighter than ever. Uh, as we go into the new year, uh, and we're almost there, uh, just uh, 31 days away, uh, I'm looking at a hopeful future for all of us. Uh, there are three possible vaccines ahead of us, and there's so much to be thankful for. It is giving December. So give whenever and wherever you can. There are two things that I'd like to mention today. It is Giving Tuesday, uh, and it is also World AIDS Day. I made a donation this morning to Broadway Cares, Equity Fights AIDS. And if any of you are able to do the same thing, I would greatly appreciate it. We all would. And I am very excited today because I get to celebrate one of my favorite people in the business, and that's Karen Ziamba. She's a Tony Award winner, and she has three additional nominations. She should be a four-time Tony Award winner and beyond. But I want to start basically with Karen's uh, big break in New York. Uh, she was part of the 50th anniversary of the Radio City Music Hall, along with the Rockettes. And I can't think of a better way to open our show today. And then you'll see Karen on the other side. Ladies and gentlemen, today we celebrate Karen Ziemba. I want to be a Rockette. I want to dance until dawn. I want to be a rocket. That's what my heart is set upon. I want to be a rocket. I want to hear the crowd roar. I want to feel the magic when they scream for more and more and more and more. And some people want to be somebody's wife. A suburban life seems a pity. I want to be a movie star. I always wanted to be a dancer at Radio City. I want to be a rocket. And it's no surprise. I want to be a rocket. Oh, how my foot is gonna rise. I want to be a rocket. That's one thing I know. And when I'm a rocket, A Broadway star Being famous has too many duties Some people want to be A ballet star I always wanted to be One of those dazzling Dazzling
I am so jealous. I've always, I've always thought that I wanted to be a rockhead, but now I changed my mind. I want to be Karen Ziemba. <laughs> oh, every time I see that, it just chokes me up. It was such a wonderful, oh, just a wonderful presentation and being able to dance. And there is such a great camera angle uh, when you are starting to make your move downstage. Yeah. And God bless that cameraman who caught that mm -hmm. shot of behind you. It's yeah. just so exhilarating. And as I said, this is giving December. And what a great way to start the month. Oh, thank, thank you for having for being me here. Well, I want to ask you, first of all, before we delve into this, because we are all experiencing uh, this uh, bizarre year together, uh, how are you doing really in the midst of all this? Well, it's it's been sort of a trajectory, as it were, in that when it first, when we first, when the first shutdown first happened in early March, everybody just was like, oh, oh my goodness, this, you know, this is really happening. And then you say, well, in a few weeks, you know, we'll come back and no. That didn't happen. And so everybody had to start jumping on the, the wagon to the train, so to speak, and just what do we have to do to keep ourselves uh, being creative and even working if we possibly couldn't get paid, which was very difficult. It sure is. Now, especially anything live, forget about mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. So it was it was very scary. And luckily we were able to get you know the stimulus um, check he, um, in this country and some of us were able to collect unemployment, which of course mm -hmm. isn't that much, but it's it, every little bit helps. But I just found everybody sort of started like, you know, cutting down and, and not doing as much shopping. Mm -hmm. and not, you just had to like really change your life. And it's been very difficult, but I have ha had some wonderful outlets. I've done a few of these virtual musicals and um, I read a book on tape uh, for Simon & Schuster, who I've worked for for many years. They love to use actors because they're great storytellers. Mm -hmm. And so there have been some things I've been able to do, but it, definitely we've had to you know, cut some corners. No question about now, it. Now, as I said at the beginning of the program, uh, today marks 264 days. Can you believe it? Uh, since our theaters shut down. Uh, March 12th, everything changed for all of us. Uh, what did your calendar look like on March 11th before we went into this? Well, one thing I knew I was definitely going to do, the, the book was the first thing, um, because every winter I usually do this one particular writer, J.A. Jantz. She writes a lot of contemporary women's fiction. Great. She has like a, you know, a, she's a mystery writer, mm -hmm. murder, you know, whatever. And uh, there's a female protagonist in all of these books that she's written. She writes like a, a real big novel every year. Uh, so that was coming up. But then making that happen, I had to do it at home. So then it was all about getting all that, you know, recording equipment for the first time. So there was that. But definite, the definite thing I had was in the summertime, I knew in, in late May, I was going to San Francisco for a few months to do a production of Follies. Wow, wow. It was Follies, which is the first time I'd ever done a production of Follies. And I was really looking forward to that, this intimate theater uh, uh, called the San Francisco Playhouse. And anyway, that was scratched, of course. So that was, you know, my health. Is there a possibility that that will come back or is it scratched? Oh. I don't know. Who knows? Uh, because I was, of course, you know, a guest artist coming in. So I don't know if they 
theater would be able to afford that. Not that I, you know, got a huge salary or anything like that, but it was, you know, everybody has had, like I said, had to cut corners and maybe they will only use local people now. I would love to be able to come back uh, and do uh, work with them and uh, probably even, you know, be willing, you know, to take a cut just to just to experience doing that show and working with them out there because I hear they do great work. So, and spending three months in, in San Francisco is not such a bad thing either. No, one of my favorite <laughs> cities. One of my favorite cities. Uh, I wanna go back uh, to five-year-old Karen Ziemba. That's where <laughs> we're gonna start today. Uh, mm -hmm. Because for me, uh, five years old is that special time in a person's life before you start getting molded by outside circumstances. When you start going to school and everything. Now I, you know, done some research, your grandmother uh, was an opera singer. Right. So you come from a family of artists, uh, but what was your life like growing up in St. Joseph, Michigan at five years old? Well, because both my parents loved music and because my mother of course came from uh, performance background, even though she wasn't a performer herself, she was influenced by a lot of music and was taken to the theater and was, you know, watched a lot of movie musicals and things like that. I remember my mother telling me every Saturday, you know, get the kids out of the house and you go like a few blocks up to Harper Avenue in Detroit and watch movies all day long, you know, all the newsreels, all the cartoons, and then a couple of features. So she saw every movie musical, every war movie, every, she knew so many names, the B, the C actors, she knew them all. And so she, you know, gave that, passed that down to me and that love of, 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 of course of movie musicals, but also of the theater and of music. And so she passed her generation, but then she gave it to me. And I was the only, um, the daughter, I had three brothers and they all loved music too, but I was the one that really took to the dancing and wanted It's always to amazing in a family, uh, especially when there are siblings involved, that there's always that one that just goes, oh my God, this is for me. This is what I want to do. Now, um, dating both of ourselves a little bit, um, did you have a hi-fi in your house and the uh, Broadway cast recordings? Uh, oh, yeah, the whole big wooden box, you know, <laughs> dropped all the different, you know, uh, 75 RPM albums down. Uh, and, and 33 and a third, uh, uh, because my, my grandmother who had done, um, a lot, of course, a lot of opera, but then had done musical theater too. She had some of those like 78s of, uh, so no, so, yeah, the, the, the smaller albums, the, the medium sized albums of, um, of, of musicals like of Mary Martin and Itzio Pinza. Yes. They, they would come in those big thick boxes, you know, of, of the show. And we used to listen to a lot of those. But yes, we had the we had the hi-fi, and then even later, when um, uh, my brothers, I had to get them into the act because I needed, you know, to fill out my cast. Of course, of course. We put on wigs and more <laughs> dresses. I mean, well, I was going to ask you, what was the cast album that you found yourself performing over and over and over again, and you just couldn't get enough of it? Oh gosh, I think Sweet Charity was one I loved because that 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 uh, score was very jazzy. Mm -hmm and sexy, and I thought, ooh, this is, you know, this is very titillating. <laughs> and it had great dance music in it, of course. But I, I still also loved, you know, The Sound of Music and My Fair Lady. And I tried to sing like Julie Andrews, and my mother was, stop it, you're hurting my ear. <laughs> <laughs> and did you get a chance to see your grandmother perform live on stage? I never did, oh. no. But uh, I remember when I was doing Crazy For You on Broadway, John Kander brought me a CD of my grandmother singing at the Hollywood Bowl, Carmen, wow. in English. He said, Karen, did you know your grandmother's on this recording with, with uh, Ramon Benet and Stokowski conducting at the Hollywood Bowl? I said, no, and he gave it to me. So I got to hear, you know, he because he's such an opera aficionado, John Kander. So he knew more <laughs> than I did. And uh, so that was a wonderful gift he gave me. But uh, I've heard many recordings of her, of course. Uh, and what was the first first show that you actually remember seeing that uh, jumped out for you? Well, I saw a high school production of My Fair Lady. I remember, and I remember the leading lady laying on a on a like a raconteur singing, I could have danced all night. And thinking, wow, she can sing so well lying down. <laughs> <laughs> and did you do any theater in school? Oh yeah. 
yes, I did a, a production of West Side Story, and I did a, after that a production of Man of La Mancha. Now we have a mutual friend, Jennifer Roberts, and she told yeah. me that she remembers you from yeah. that production of West Side Story. Mm -hmm. And she said she remembers saying she's going to go places. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now. Um, but what was that deciding moment? First of all, let me back up for a moment uh, mm -hmm. because arts and education is something that's very important to me. Uh, and what was your exposure to the arts when you were in school? Well, you know, we had a film class, we had, you know, drama class, we had like um, the Shakespeare is literature, but not that much. I mean, the, we did one musical a year at my high school, and that was it. In junior high, nothing. In elementary school, nothing. I did have a wonderful second grade teacher, however, that played the piano. So we did do, I remember, some little class production of Cinderella or something. Mm -hmm. but not a lot when I was growing up, where I grew up. Uh, but I definitely got my butt in there to audition for the musicals. However, I did have a choral director in high school who should have been like teaching on the college level, but he was teaching in the high school level. And I learned how to um, uh, sing in, sing Latin, six part harmony, even though I played a little piano so I could read music, but I was always the second soprano. So I was always in the middle and had to learn, had to have a good ear for fitting in the middle, but I learned how to sing choral music. And that really helped me kind of form me as far mm -hmm. as, singing in ensembles on Broadway and being able to learn music quickly. Now, I know that you also had training in ballet. Did you have a preference that you wanted to pursue either as a dancer or as a singer or as an actress, or do they all just uh, come together? They did come together eventually, but when I graduated high school, I was really in this concert dancer trajectory. I really wanted to go uh, and try to get into a dance company or a ballet company. And I did dance with the Ohio Ballet for a season. They were a small regional theater, uh, a regional company, just like every other city had back in the seventies because everybody was funded, remember, with the NEA. And uh, right. Ohio actually had like about five different companies, every big city, Columbus, Dayton, Cincy. Cincy still has one, but all those large, industrial cities had like a lot of arts organizations and had ballet companies mm -hmm. and Akron, which is where, um, you know, they had Firestone tired rubber, you know, and so there was quite a lot of industrialists there and they had a nice symphony. They had the ballet company. And so that's what I thought I wanted to do, but I just didn't quite cut the mustard. I was a good dancer, but I didn't have like the mind for it. It was like, I wanted to express myself in more ways than just, through the dance, even though that was sort of my, the sort of was my, were my roots, and but hey, it was a good place to start because absolutely when, uh, you, it reminds me of Shirley MacLaine. She wanted to be a ballet dancer. Right? She was the tallest one in the class, and they kept saying, "You're not going to get these parts." So, and look what happened. <laughs> well, it's exactly. So, how did you make the move to New York? Oh, I was. Uh, I was uh, selling programs at for the for the Kenley Players. Oh my God, the Kenley we had, Players! We had this incredible summer stock company that uh, played actually, played Flint, Michigan, and played Warren, Ohio. It kind of was like a little tour uh, every summer, and he brought in the biggest stars to uh, headline all the different shows. And they did about five or six shows, a couple plays and three musicals. Uh, every summer, and when I was going to uh, U of Akron and, and, and after I danced with the Ohio Ballet, I said, you know, I'm staying, I'm finishing my degree, and I worked for John Kenley, and he never hired me it to be in the cast. He would always get his dancers from New York City. Mm. Uh, because they were You know, don't you think that we are so lucky that we came along at a time where these stars from movies and television uh, would do summer stock and perform all over the country. And you don't really see that that much anymore. That is not that much. No. Yeah. It's, you were selling programs with Ken Lee. Yeah. Yeah. Selling programs with Ken Lee. And met um, someone who had, had been a conductor there and had seen a show. We started talking and he said, you're a singer dance. So I, uh, I did, did some singing for them and they said, Karen, you're, you're, Pretty good. You should to think about maybe you know making the trip to New York and spending some time there or making the move. And 
I did. Um, and my parents said, okay, let's, mm. let's try this for a while. And it just, it worked out okay. And I think, especially my mother, she knew, she knew that there was that drive. She knew that I probably had some chops at that point. Cause I had done, of course, the musicals at school. I had danced professionally um, or semi-professionally um, in a ballet company back in Michigan too, before I went to, to college. And so I had, I knew how to how to behave as a professional, even though I needed a lot more training, you know, vocally and acting wise too. Uh, so I did all that more so when I got into college and then on to uh, when I moved to New York. Now, did you put any time limits on you or did you just come out and say, I'm just gonna go for it, full throttle? Yeah, no time limits. I wasn't like, a, I'm gonna be a star by the time. <laughs> That didn't work for me. I just wanted to work. And I was so fortunate that I had the dance background, that I had sung all my life in the living room, in church choir, in high school choral, choral in college, had done all that. And it served me. It just, it was all there, all, everything had been planted. And then, of course, dancing professionally with the ballet company, it just, it, it all just fed into, okay. Now we need four dancers and four singers and they have to do everything, you know, and the dancers have to sing, the singers have to dance because that was when they started cutting down companies in summer stock too. They could only like afford like eight ensemble people made to do everything. And that's where I came in. And luckily I had all that training. Now I want to ask you when you first arrived in New York, did you know anyone here in New York or did you just come in knowing no one? What were those early days like for you? I didn't know too many people. Um, uh, the conductor gentleman that I knew, that I met at the Kenley Players, he he, he had, um, he and his son lived in New York City and I had, there was an extra bedroom in the apartment. So I rented that for a year and got my first equity job in a summer stock production of My Fair Lady. And wasn't that North Shore? Where yeah, North Shore. Because yeah. they do all the cartwheels in the buskers. I'm getting married in the morning and I can also say, hey, do and, uh, and, you know, <laughs> <laughs> Professor Higgins, I mean, all of that. And so, how long were you in New York before that happened? Not very long. That was about, um, well, almost a year, almost a year. I wait, waited tables. I, well, I was going to ask you what kind of survival jobs you had. I waited tables. I um, My favorite was being an usher because then I got to see the shows. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was, I never worked as a, as a union usher, of course, but like in establishments that mm -hmm. hired on, you know, you know, off the street. Hey, yeah, I want to be an usher kind of thing. And I was willing to put up with, you know, people's voice, you know, people complaining and I don't like this seat and stuff like that and passing out programs. It wasn't that difficult, but you had to stand up at the back and watch the show. And I love that. So your first big break in New York came when you were hired to be part of the 50th anniversary celebration of Radio City Music Hall. Um, take us back to that moment. How, uh, first of all, did, the, did you find out about the audition? Uh, were you going through backstage or did you have an agent who got you the audition? How did it come about? I don't remember exactly that, but I think it was probably from a backstage type thing because I didn't have much experience at that point. I had gotten my equity card at that point because I had done the summer stock and I'd done a couple other dinner theater productions, but they were looking for, again, three female singer dancers and three male singer dancers to be these the, the sort of like the three musical theater Broadway types in this 50th anniversary production along with the Rockettes, along with this specialty act, along with this, it was, it had the glory of Easter. It had, it was jam packed with everything. And, and we all did a big Broadway 50 year medley that somebody had put together. It was terrific. And how many performances a week were you doing? Cause they do a lot. Like 12 or something. It was like wow. two a day. Wow. That was when they used to do a show every summer. Like now, so. someone who was watching uh, mentioned uh, a clip, uh, a performance of yours uh, that happens to be one of their favorites. And it just so happens that I have it queued. So I'm going to share this now. You don't know what it is. <laughs> Later you're gonna 
gonna be mine Sooner or later you're gonna be fine Maybe it's time that you faced it I always get my and shadow that settle the matter Baby, you're mine on a platter I always get my man If you insist, babe The challenge delights me The more you resist, babe The more Excites me, and no one I kissed, babe, ever fights me again. If you're on my list, it's just a question of when. When I get a yes, then, baby. And that, of course, is Bill Irwin, who used to be a neighbor of mine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I want to thank Doug Miles for mentioning that that was one of his favorite clips because it just so happens that I had it queued up. Uh -huh. Now, Karen, I first became familiar with you in 1991, I think it was, uh, when you did uh, But the World Goes Round. Mm -hmm. um, and you have, uh, you've done a lot of Kander and Ebb's music. Um, and uh, two years ago, uh, you were part of our show when we celebrated uh, John Kander's birthday. Wow. Um, how did this relationship begin? And obviously, there's this bond that's been a continuing uh, force throughout your career. Well, back then, before there was a lot of internet in the early 90s, actually, we started um, And the World Goes Round um, way off Broadway in New Jersey at the Whole Theater. Right. And what happened was, is that Scott Ellis and Susan Stroman had done a production of 
uh, Floor of the Red Menace at the Vineyard Theater with John Kander and Fred Ebb. And Scott Ellis had known John Kander and Fred Ebb from doing The Rink on Broadway. He was in the ensemble of The Rink with Cheetah mm -hmm. Rivera and Liza Minnelli. And he, he was slowly, you know, becoming a director, a young director. And he said, I really would love to do a show that encompasses a lot of Kander and Ebb's music. I mean, you couldn't do like a, all their stuff because it would just, their trunks are just mm -hmm. changing packs. They have too much music, but they had to choose what they wanted to do. And and he got together with Susan's old friends, Susan Stroman and Tommy Thompson, David Thompson, and uh, they put together the show. And the world was round the songs of Kander and Ebb. And I had done, a, what a, what about, what the reason why I mentioned the internet was because to find people you had to do it through word of mouth if you were looking for somebody in particular and to find out somebody's reputation. You couldn't go on Facebook. There was no Facebook to say like, hmm, what's this person like? Or what? Would you like to go back to that time? <laughs> <laughs> I would, yes. Yes, yes. Uh, so they asked the gentleman who was my director on a production of Pajama Game at New York City Opera, who I just worked with, Ted Pappas. And Ted Pappas had directed that production starring Judy Kay and Lenora Nemitz, and I was Lenora's understudy. Mm. I'd recently gone on for Lenora for a couple performances, and Ted Pappas had to get me into that role too sweet because uh, Lenora had an injury, so I had to get go on very quickly. And Ted knew that I could like, you know, pick up steps and and do do the job, and I paid attention during rehearsals, and I just went on and I did these two two performances, it went very well. And so when somebody said, oh, I don't know Karen Z this, so uh, who, 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 does anybody know she is? Oh, I know some, Ted Pappas just worked with her recently at New York City Opera, let's ask him, because they were friends of his, uh, Stro and, and and Scott and everybody. And he said, yeah, she she can deliver, give her, give her a try, you know? And so I got this audition because they were looking for one more person in this, group of five people, somebody who could sing and dance and do all the, uh, that kind of mm -hmm. Shirley McLean stuff, do the Gwen yeah. stuff, you know? And so that's how it happened. And I had to go sing for John Kander and Fred Ebb and all of them. And I remember, I've told the story many times, how the way they treated me and the way they treat everybody. Yes. John and Fred were, are just the most, uh, Fred, of course, we love, we love mm -hmm. but, um, John is one of the kindest, most generous, brightest, funniest, just loveliest men I've ever met, along with being such a great artist. And he, the way he treated, he stood up, he walked toward me, he shook my hand, he said, would you please sing that now a step higher? <laughs> <laughs> and of course you could. Let's hear it a step higher. Play, you know, he, he See, mom, those Julie Andrews uh, albums help. <laughs> But you know, it's just the way he treated me, like I was, you know, like I was, uh, like I was an artist too, as opposed to just like, oh, what do you got next? You know, hey, what's your what's your up tempo? What's your what's your balance? Whatever. He, they were just such gentlemen, and from then on, there was this sort of bond. And mm -hmm. I got that job, obviously, and I've continued to work with John and Susan Stroman um, for many, many years. And. Now, when I look at your career, Karen, um, first of all, so many phenomenal roles that you've done. And as I see this through line with you, I wonder how much of it has been you being very proactive and going after these jobs and how many of them have come to you? And at what point did they start saying, uh, get us a Karen Ziamba type? <laughs> <laughs> I think there, it's all of that. Uh... I think that your reputation follows you uh, as far as you as a, as a human being and mm -hmm. how, how you're willing to go to the mat and take risks and say yes. And you also have to be, on the other hand, strong and demanding when you pick your battles properly. I mean, mm -hmm. there's things it's like, mm, I'm not going to deal with that one. Well, without m mentioning any situation or anything, because I'm all about celebrating, what was the biggest battle that you've had to face in your career? Oh, you know, there's always certain people that you've worked with that cause a little ajna. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And we won't mention any names in no. specifically, but it's uh, that those are like glitches, though. Well. And you just hope that you don't necessarily have to share the stage with them again because it's more about them and not about us. Mm -hmm. 
And the thing with the theater is, unless you're doing your own number on stage or your own show, and even when you're doing your own show, you still have your pianist and you still have your lighting designer, the people that make you look good. It's all about the team. And I believe in that so strongly. And I think- Oh, me too. It's a, you know, it's a collaboration. Absolutely. It always is. Absolutely. And even if you're on the stage solo, it's still a collaboration. Yeah. They're lighting people, they're designers, they're all the people that come together to make this happen. Mm -hmm. And then let's jump ahead because uh, we could be here all day. I, there's so many incredible moments. 2000. I'm still here. You're still here. 2000 and contact. I mean, obviously you'd worked with Susan Stroman. Did she contact you and say, I want you to be a part of this? How did that come about? And, all, and then all of a sudden the excitement around this show. It was funny because I, uh, she invited me to come see a workshop at Lincoln Center Theater of this piece she had been working on called Contact. And it was just at that point, the second act, the dance, the dance club with this girl in the yellow dress and this mm -hmm. executive who wants to, you know, end his life, finds her and they dance and every, all the dancers around them. And it was to all these different kinds of music. And I thought, wow, this is really a phenomenal piece. And then she got in touch with me and said, you know, Casey, I want, I want you to listen to this music. I'd like you to maybe, we're going to noodle around with something and make this into a full evening, a full, you know, three act thing, two short pieces. And then con this other piece contact that you just saw at the end. And I thought, oh, cool. This, this was such a great piece. I'd love to be part of it. So she sends me this music and it's all this classical music played by the New York Philharmonic. And I thought, that has nothing to do with con this kind mm -hmm. of jazzy pop contact thing. And I said, this is ballet music. So what do you want me to do? She goes, well, you're going to do ballet. You're, this particular piece that we've put, John Wyden and I have constructed is about a woman who goes into her fantasies and dances ballet. And I was like, okay. So that's how that happened. And uh, I didn't know whether it was going to be any good. I, I remember I had a few very close people come to see that workshop once we finally put that up. And they said, I said, what do you guys think? Is this something that I should do? They said, oh, Karen, this is so moving and so good and funny. And, and you're really good in it. You, you really need to continue with this, uh, this project. And uh, so I did. And they were right. And it wasn't, I mean, yes, I, that was my Tony winning performance. And what was that moment like when your name is called and you're sitting there and, and for you? Oh, it's, 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 it's very validating. And it's, for me, it happened much later in my career. So. And you were in, a, I mean, such great talent. Arthur Kitt was nominated that oh, year. I mean, uh, I me. <laughs> I <know. laughs> and I mean, and your name was called, it was exciting. I remember it, you know, like it was yesterday. And so where do you keep your Tony? A lot of people want to know. It holds up. Um, books on my bookshelf in, in the living room. A lot of wonderful theater books. And Hal Prince's book, last book, is right up there because he was the last person I worked with, my last no. brother. Um, but I was just listening to that recording this morning. It's great. I mean, uh, there are so many roles that you got a chance to do in that review. Um, uh, and I'm wondering, out of those roles, uh, are there certain roles that you still aspire to right now? You're talking about Prince of Broadway. Yes, uh, Prince of Broadway. Yes. I've never done a production of Cabaret. I'd love to play in Alcroft Schneider sometime. It's, um, it's, it's it, you know, the, the La Valenia role. I'm reading her book, a, a book, a biography on her right now. It's fascinating, her life. You know, it's so funny because I was reading uh, a few weeks ago and it was her birthday. Mm. And uh, I live in Rockland County. And she's buried here in Rockland County. So I went, I was going to go to her grave site, but I couldn't find it. The, I mean, the cemetery, uh, there is a marker for mm -hmm. her in Kurt Vile, um, but uh, I, you know, I could not find where the grave was. Whoa. Now, I want to give a shout out for a moment to my designer, uh, Chuck, who helps me put these shows together. And uh, he had a question that he wanted me to ask you today. Uh, growing up and being in school, um, with the last name Ziemba, mm -hmm. were you always the last one called in roll call in the class? Yes. 
And what was that experience like for you? Well, there was a couple of people that had ZY or ZU because uh, I graduated uh, with a class of our senior class was like 450 kids. It was it was a pretty good size uh, suburban high school. But before that, I was usually last and I'm usually last on the roll call on Broadway, too. When I sign in, um, there was one person who was after me, Lee Zimmerman, when I did. Oh. She was after me. But other than that, I'm always, I got the big, now the Z can go down as far as it wants, the bottom oh, of the page. You are an amazing talent on stage, <laughs> but your television body of work, you know, I wasn't familiar with all of this. I've seen some of these, uh, but you are such a natural uh, uh, in that medium as well. Um, was it an easy transition going from stage to doing the television work? Well, you got to tone it down a bit, you know, and of course, working uh, technically in that in in television, it's just a very different um, medium. In that, it, not only like you have to hit your marks and all that kind of stuff, but as a like a, an episode going into an episode and playing it, doing a day player with the people that have been there every single day, like you know Mariska Hargitay and, and mm -hmm. Maloney. You just Peter Maloney, you just have to. Know your know what you're doing before you get there because you don't want to make so many mistakes that they have to keep waiting for you and it's tough. You got to really be on top of things because you want to expedite the scenes and get through it because they have to take so many different angles. It's all one camera and like a film. And so, but I just I loved it. I love working on it. And have you done any of these roles that we just saw when you were actually doing shows at night as well? Oh yeah. Oh sure. Oh wow. Yes, I remember. Can't even remember which which Law and Order it was, but um, I remember having to run. I was doing I was doing one of the musicals in Mufti at the York. Oh yeah. When I was doing Weird Romance, and I had to run back and forth. Oh, it was when I was doing the one with Kevin Ty, who was playing the the mean doctor, who was killing mm -hmm. his patients. Who <laughs> <laughs> wanted to give me orders? That's why I'm asking what it is about you and doctors. <laughs> That one was so much fun. He was such a great guy. He's such a great actor. Just such, he's so wonderfully creepy and good, but he's really a good guy. Oh, he's perfect. He's just perfect in that role. But yeah, I was going. I was shuttling back and forth, and I made it. I was able to get their time, and they were very compliant with me at, at the York, and said, "Okay, you know, <laughs> let's let's try to make this work." And uh, but yeah, I sometimes at both at the same time. Now, I, 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 the last time that I saw you uh, perform in stock was when I saw you play Mama Rose, oh. another brilliant performance of yours. Oh. Um, what are some of the dream roles that you haven't done? Or what were some of the ones that you came very close to doing that got away? Oh, geez. Uh, I've been very lucky. I've gotten a chance to play many. Sometimes you age out of things. Uh, I I was able to, for one night, I always wanted to play Nellie Forbush, and I got a chance to do a one-night gala for Lincoln Center Theater when I was doing Contact. We mm. did um, one of the Monday nights with an all-star cast with Pat Suzuki and Bill Murray as, as Billis, and uh, I did, George Hearn played Emile DeBeck. It was, that was a wonderful experience. Some of the, um, you know, some of the roles that I wanted to play, I've been lucky. I've got, you know, finally got to, you know, play Dolly Levi, and I played Mrs. Lovett a couple times now, and also been in Prince of Broadway. And I hopefully will do these roles again in different uh, venues. I still mm -hmm. want to do a production of Follies before I get, you know. <laughs> uh, I want to, you know, do an overall of the trajectory of your career and looking back. Uh, you know, what are some of the changes that you've seen happen in the business uh, that you have uh, truly embraced? And what are some of the changes that you still have a resistance to? Well, there, as far as what I, what I don't have a resistance to, which, which I, when I was speaking with students that want to go into this business, young people, about just what we were talking about before about the collaboration of how it's not just about you there's mm -hmm. no way you're going to make it unless you realize that there's so many other pieces to the puzzle and and yet there is that you do have to have a really strong ego because there's so much rejection even if you're gifted 
Mm -hmm. There's times that, mm, no, you're not tall enough. You're not thin enough. You're not heavy enough. You're not blonde enough. You're not dark, you know, all of this stuff. No, we're looking for something else. It's, it's like, it's not you particularly. It's just the type you're looking for. And so that you have to be strong about. And if you, if you really need this in your life, you will, you will excel and you will do well, but mm -hmm. if you don't need to do it. I say like, mm, do something else. And there also are so many different kinds of work, so, so much different kind of work in the theater. Mm -hmm. Life theater that you can do with it doesn't have to do with being center stage. Mm -hmm. But it's filling out all the other places that are so necessary to put on a show. We were talking about before too. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, what's definitely changed is all the social media and how mm -hmm. they are advertised and how you advertise yourself. Mm -hmm. That's that's the biggest change. And a lot of times people get cast one person over next because they have more followers than somebody else. And that doesn't necessarily have to do with- And I've also heard that some casting directors uh, bring people in uh, based on their followers on Instagram. Yes, because they know that they will uh, get the exposure and people will tune in and that's what they want. It's like putting butts in seats in the theater. It's like having those people that Tune in. There's so many different networks now. And okay. It's crazy. Now, obviously, you don't have the answer to this next question. It's only spe speculation. Uh, but how do you um, see theater coming back in New York? Ooh, that's a really tough question. But uh, it's in New York, of course, especially on Broadway, it's going to have to do with who is coming. A lot of it's tourism. Mm -hmm. I think the big shows that always had uh, decent audiences will come back. Wicked, probably, um, you know. Lion uh, King. Lion King, and we hope Hamilton because it's such an important seminal musical. But you've got a lot of people on stage. You've got to meet a lot of people in those audiences sitting cheek by jowl. It's going to be very interesting how things go in, in 2021 as far as vaccines and everything else, of course when we look at that side of it, but it's like, who's going to want to come back to New York city for that. And a lot of there's theater all over the country in many different cities, but a lot of those places are the main cities, mm -hmm. the States that have had the, the toughest time with the coronavirus and getting that at bay. It's, it's really changed uh, the way we think about how we move around in our country mm -hmm. and, we exist uh, and unfortunately theater is all about being together mm -hmm. absolutely like our church, you know it's like it's our other church absolutely and now it's my it's nice looking back Karen but what's next for you oh gosh right now I'm doing um, a couple of things for the actors fund I'm doing a production a virtual production of two by two by Richard Rogers and Martin Chernin, uh, that we will be hopefully oh, wonderful. it will be on Christmas Day. Oh, yeah. wonderful! You know, little squares singing and you know acting, and then I'm doing another one for uh, the Gingold Group uh, Project Shaw. We're doing different speeches and poems. oh, they do such great work, David Stoller. David, thank yeah. you. Yeah, doing that I believe on the 14th of December. So a couple things coming up uh, next month. After that, it's. We don't know. I don't know for sure, but I have a couple of things that I've already done out there. A thing called Quarantween, the musical mm -hmm. I did um, months ago, which is about a bunch of kids putting on a musical at home with their friends. And I play the, the grandma uh, who is a former uh, performer who's giving her advice via the Internet and her, her granddaughter uh, advice. And I have another one uh, that I uh, there's a couple of things. Oh, I did, worked with Stroman again on a, a project that uh, they're probably going to show to investors and producers. We'll see how that goes. It, it, you just keep moving forward, one foot in front of the other. It's <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Well, I can't believe this, but we are at the end of our program. Uh, and it means the world to me that you kicked off December. Uh, the bar is raised so high now. Uh, mm -hmm. It's going to be tough for me this month. Uh, but I want to thank you. I want to thank everybody who tuned in. We had a great audience watching today. Um, if you enjoyed the show, and if you haven't done so already, uh, please go to my website, richardskipper.com 
sign my guest book with your thoughts about the show. Uh, that helps to boost me and other markets. I also end every show by telling everyone to go out and do something nice for somebody else without expecting anything in return. Go to your Facebook friends list and go to the first name that pops up on your list and give them a call today. Not an email, not a text, a phone call. And let that person know what they mean to you personally. Now, um, I also want to let you know that tomorrow afternoon, I will be back with uh, Canadian sensation and comedian Maggie Casella. She's one of the funniest people I know, and I'm very, very excited about tomorrow's show. It will be at two o'clock. Please come back and join us. And before we sign off, Karen, I'm going to give you the final word. Anything you want to say about anything that we talked about today that you want to expound upon, uh, anything you want to bring up that we didn't talk about, that you wish that we had, or just any message that you want to give to everyone who's watching at this time. And again, thank you so much for all that you've done for all of us. Uh, you are the best. Thank you. I just thank you for ending your program positively because that's what we need right now is a big shot of that, along with the vaccine, <laughs> is yeah. about, uh, about optimism and doing something for somebody else because that just makes your heart bigger and makes you feel good. Uh, and I, and thank you for what you do and how you uh, advocate artists and people who are singers in the cabaret world and, and and try to put them up on a pedestal to say like, hey, you got to you got to notice this person. It's uh, it's about you, but it's also about everybody else that you feel very strongly about. And so thank you thank for you. having the show and just for what you do for humanity. Wow, that means a lot. Thank you. A little something is. It really helps. Just a little something. Thank um, you. Now, everyone go out and make it a better today and even better tomorrow. Happy December. Yeah. We're here. Happy Bye. holidays. Thank you. Bye.